everyone for, for joining this uh, first uh, transdisciplinary Thursday seminar. Um, it's a, a great pleasure to have our, our first speaker uh, going to talk about uh, plants and microbes. Uh, and uh, this, this first speaker is, is Sofian Kamoun. So it, it wasn't a random pick. We really uh, tried to, to find someone who has been uh, deeply interested in, in transdisciplinary research. And I'm sure Sofian's talk will be a, a great uh, illustration of, of what can be done by combining different research fields. So before we hear the talks by Sofian, I wanted to uh, give a very brief introduction. I'm sure most of, know, most of you know uh, well, uh, Sofian, so I'll be very quick. Uh, Sofian did his, his uh, PhD at the University of California, Davis, uh, then he moved to uh, Wageningen and then back to the US uh, at uh, Ohio State University, uh, where he had his, his group uh, working on uh, plant pathogen interaction, in particular uh, with uh, potato as a, as a model um, uh, target uh, plant species. Uh, in 2007, uh, Sofian moved to uh, Sainsbury Lab in Norwich. At the uh, sorry, just turning off. Uh, at the Sainsbury Laboratory, where he started his group, uh, still working on 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 plant microbe interaction, uh, in particular on Phytophthora, and and of course on the plant uh, immune mechanisms uh, controlling this interaction. Um, I wanted to make a list of all the awards and, and other amazing things he has done. So I started the list and then I, I stopped. So if you want to, to see the, the list, just go on, on Wikipedia. There is a very well designed web page for Sofian and you will see all the amazing awards he, he received. That said, there are two things I wanted to highlight uh, besides the, the amazing science uh, Sofian has done over the, the last few decades now. Uh, first is that Sofian is not only a writing science, is also writing about science, about academia, and, and society and science. Uh, and he has a, a blog uh, where he posts uh, short articles on, on these different topics. And I really encourage you to have a look at this, at this articles. It's, it's really full of, of really good advices for uh, researchers at all stages of their careers. So please, please have a look uh, at, at the blog post from, from Sofian. And the other thing is that uh, for my own research, uh, Sofian has been extremely inspirational. Uh, and I think uh, it was one of the first, if not the first, to uh, really include evolution as part of his uh, thinking of plant microbe interaction, not only to study evolution because evolution is amazing, but also because through evolution, we can learn a lot about biological processes. And uh, in 2018, uh, Sofian and, and students in, in his lab wrote uh, a review about EVO MPMI, so evolutionary developmental genetics of molecular plant microbe interaction, and that really coined this uh, EVO MPMI term, which is which makes a lot of sense uh, nowadays in, in the study of, of biology in general. Uh, so it's it's really uh, great to have you, Sofian, uh, presenting this first talk of this transdisciplinary Thursday uh, seminars. And I'm really looking forward to uh, to hearing your your uh, your presentation, which will be amazing, I'm sure. Thank you a lot, uh, Sofian, for, for agreeing to give this talk. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Pierre Marc, for a very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to uh, talk to you today. I'm actually in, in, in Tunisia. In fact, I'm in, in the bedroom where I grew up, <laughs> so, <laughs> in, my, in my mom's house, and. Um, uh, it, it brought some memory um, uh, to me because uh, we spent the last weekend, uh, which was the uh, Ayid here, you know, it's the end of Ramadan, so it was a holiday. So we went to uh, the northwest of the country. And uh, when I was 18 year old, um, what uh, Pierre Marc didn't uh, mention in his introduction is that I did my undergraduate, I did maîtrise in Paris, in Paris, uh, which is now uh, Sorbonne University. And uh, uh, when I was a kid in high school, we, we really didn't have here um, any type of mentoring in terms of becoming an entomologist and things like that. So I went to Paris with the firm idea of becoming an entomologist. Uh, I did not become an entomologist, but I, um, I, I learned in my first few months how to, um, to do all the entomology stuff. And I, uh, I bought some equipment too. And my first opportunity, which was 38 years ago, when I was 18, I came to Tunisia and I went to the exact same region where we spent the weekend and I actually collected, I have, still have a lot of insects from that time. And so um, so my roots actually, for those of you who are not molecular biologists, my roots are really in organism and biology. This is uh, 
Hopefully, uh, Billy Nieta, which I took the photo yesterday, uh, it, it just came out uh, because the weather got warm uh, last few days. And, and it allows me also to, to mention this first slide. If you're a biologist, in my opinion, and uh, this is an opinion I had very early in my career, fortunately, uh, you cannot ignore DNA, you cannot ignore evolution, and you cannot ignore diversity or biodiversity. These are, to me, the three central tenets of biological sciences, of life sciences. And many of these are unique, like the concept of DNA, the concept that the code of the organism is coded in the DNA, and it, which is a replicating type of code, uh, is, is a very unique concept to biology, the, co the concept that things are actually evolving and they are associated by this chain of heredity is, is really um, also very unique to, I think physicists, for example, struggle with this concept. I know that because I have many physicists friends, they, they really struggle with evolution. And of course, DNA and evolution lead to diversity. So we cannot claim that we understand biology and the living world by studying one or two organisms. And, and uh, okay, another plug. So uh, Pierre-Marc mentioned about the blog, I'll give you the link later, but if you're interested in this topic, also I really recommend as a starting point, this article I wrote where I'm, I'm actually trying to make uh, an argument for integrating evolutionary science into our mechanistic thinking. And uh, I'm using the smartphone as, as, as a metaphor. You can read it and see if it makes sense or not. But uh, I, I think it's, it's an interesting uh, metaphor uh, for various reasons, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about it. I'll just let you uh, explore this if you're interested. And actually, the barcode leads to a talk on YouTube, which is about this topic. So if you don't feel like reading the article, you can watch the talk. But I think uh, Pierre Marc and many others now are uh, really uh, heavily sort of focused on this idea of filling the gap between mechanistic research and evolutionary biology. And I think this is a little bit the topic, if I understand, of, of this um, series of sort of the interdisciplinary approach to biological questions. And I, I really love this, this quote. Um, in the absence of an evolutionary perspective, mechanistic understanding of biological systems is unlikely to shed light on their messiness because biological systems are messy. So if you want to understand mechanistically how they work, we need to bring in evolution and we need to fill in the gap. And in our field of plant microbe interactions, we like to call this EVO and PMI, sort of evolutionary molecular plant microbe interaction, a little bit like the EVO-DEVO uh, type of um, uh, moniker for, uh, for our field. And uh, of course, um, these uh, Francis Crick quotes are, are wonderful, especially because Francis Crick is the father of the double helix. And um, so he, he's rooted into molecular biology. It's really his double helix was the beginning of molecular biology. So the, even the origins of molecular biology, there was an awareness that evolution is, interest, is important, it's interesting, it's critical. Uh, and so, it must be thought that evolution would play a large part in guiding biological research, but this is far from the case. So Crick in his book was really wondering why evolutionary biology is not more important in biological sciences. And that's some question I think, and, and an issue that we are trying to address by filling the gap. Okay, so um, before I move into plants, I wanted to use a metaphor also to highlight this issue of evolutionary biology and also the issue of diversity. So imagine you're uh, a biologist who studies penguins and only penguins, that's your model system. And you're interested in wings. You realize penguins have wings and you want to study penguin wings. You're going to make really interesting discoveries. You're going to find that wings have evolved in swimming and they may be involved in other things, maybe in communication and so on between penguins. Etc. You write very good papers; they will be correct, etc. But your view of wings will be so limited because you're only studying this one organism. And obviously, we know that if you really step back and ask the question, "Why do birds have wings?" you would not be able to answer that question. In fact, you will have the wrong answer by studying just penguins. So at this point, and I'll get back to this later. Believe me or not, this is related to plant immune receptors. But I'll get back to this point later. But uh, the comparative approach, understanding diversity, going beyond single model systems is absolutely critical in biological sciences. 
Okay, so that was my brief overview and brief introduction uh, and some maybe general ideas to get you going. Now let's talk about plants and the plant immune system. So the first thing we need to accept that plants have an immune system like every other organism. We had a wonderful talks in our campus last week from Rotem Sorek on uh, the immune system of bacteria, which believe it or not is related to the immune system of plants and all the eukaryotes and bacteria have to fight phages, bacteriophages, and they have an immune system. So it's not surprising at all that every single organism have an immune system and plants also have an immune system. Uh, strangely enough, it really um, took a while before the concept really sort of solidified as being acceptable. And, and because of this immune system, um, disease is really the exceptions. Plants are very good at fighting off the average pathogen they encounter. So in most cases, plants are actually immune to the pathogens they are encountering. If you take an average pathogen, an average plant, you put them in contact, the pathogen will fail to infect that plant. Disease is the exception. The pathogen had to really figure out ways of overcoming the plant immune system and other forms of defense to really uh, infect um, the plant. And the reason pathogens do that is because they secrete effectors. So we now know that all pathogens secrete virulence factors, let's call them effectors, and they perturb plants in many ways, uh, binding host proteins, inhibiting them, activating them, creating short circuits, and that allows them to basically cause disease and infect that particular plant. So the effector repertoire has to be adapted to that particular host for a disease to happen, for the infection to happen. But what's really beautiful about this, this system, and this is really sort of ABC of plant microbe interaction, is that this is a yin, yin yang type of system because plants have immune receptors that can detect the effectors. And so when a plant happens to have an immune receptor that detects one of these effectors, and actually that's the most frequent, by far the most frequent situation that plants can actually detect the pathogens. And they can detect these effectors either directly by binding the effector, as you can see here, uh, indirectly by using a host target that is modified by the effector and detecting that modified uh, self, if you like, or the modified target. And sometimes by um, evolving um, domains that are mimicking the host targets of the effector and detecting the effector directly through this uh, integrated domain. And I'll, I'll tell you about this concept in a moment. But when the plant has a single receptor that detects a single effector or single perturbation even if you like then the plant would be resistant and this is why the plant immune system is so successful uh, because they have the genomes of plants are littered with these immune receptor genes so i will focus on uh, a particular class of immune receptors uh, the intracellular immune receptors and they belong to this class of the nlrs uh, or a nucleotide binding leucine bridge repeats. They're named after the central domain, which is nucleotide binding domains, basically switch. Okay, it does not make it very complicated. Think of this as light switch. It's either on or off. Most of the time it's off. When the pathogen is there, it will switch on. And then uh, the leucine bridge repeat, which is also a defining feature of these proteins in, uh, in plants. And there are these different N-terminal domains, which have different activities and are essentially uh, most of the time executing the uh, immune response. Another uh, basic concept for those of you who are not plant pathologists, then um, uh, the immune response in plant is this cell death response. We call the hypersensitive cell death. You can see it here very clearly. So this is an experimental system. We're co-expressing an immune receptor and an effector that are matching. And we can see the uh, hypersensitive response here in this experimental immune system, uh, experimental uh, system for plant immunology, uh, which allows us to basically visualize the uh, response, the immune response that plants have. And this can be done very quickly by infiltrating these leaves with bacteria that are expressing or that help deliver uh, or help express these genes in the plant leaf. So uh, I just want to give you this just as an introduction so you, you can follow some of the things I'll tell you later. Okay, so uh, it, the first paper really on, on, on this topic uh, dates back to the early 90s. And I was, that was when people start sequencing genomes. So Detlef Weigel was one of the pioneers. 
not sequencing a single genome, but sequencing multiple plant genomes. Uh, and, and this is actually the first paper looking at genomic or genetic diversity in a plant species that was in Arabidopsis. The first thing they immediately noticed is that by far the most polymorphic uh, gene family in plants are these NLR genes. You can see them here. Uh, by far, really, they are super polymorphic. So this is looking at single nucleotide polymorphism in terms of their frequency in particular gene families. And, and, and so the, the plants uh, don't have, plants don't have an adaptive immune system like mammals do, but at the level of the population, there is so much diversity that it's probably sort of a quasi adaptive system at, at the population level, in the sense that there's so much diversity that probably within a population, there's always a few plants that are resistant to uh, the pathogens they encounter. Uh, so that, that's how, how it works in plants. And this is a pioneering paper, and they made that observation. This has been validated over and over, not just in terms of uh, nucleotide polymorphism, but also in terms of structural variation. So the, the presence, absence, the pan nlr of the species, it's much, much larger. It's much, much larger than a single individual of that species. We uh, tried to also organize things. This was actually a lockdown project um, uh, for us when we were home and we wondered what we could do. We um, were aware that plant NLRs are very heavily studied and we made this database we call Ref Plant NLR, uh, which has uh, about 450 ex experimentally validated NLRs. So these are really very heavily studied in plant biology and also in plant breeding because they are useful genes for disease resistance. But the reason I'm showing you this is to show you the bias in research. Okay, so Arabidopsis, uh, some Solanaceae, potato, tomato, particularly, and then uh, the cereals, rice, wheat, barley. If you exclude these three uh, plant taxa or plant groups, then um, there's hardly anything is being studied. And we, when we uh, looked at how many plant orders have uh, validated NLRs, is only 11 um, of, out of the dozens of plant orders. And, and obviously, uh, this is only looking at angiosperms, at flowering plants. So if you look at non-flowering plants, then you have basically uh, no validated NLR up to date. So this is, again, getting to my point of the bias. I mean, this is a super polymorphic gene family within one species. And now we look at the plant diversity, and there's hardly any studies outside this three um, group of plant species. The same is also true for the pathogens and the parasites that are um, uh, that are associated with these experimentally validated NLRs. Most of the research is on fungi and oomycetes, fungus-like organisms, um, uh, a little bit on bacteria and viruses, but outside that, there's hardly anything. Very little uh, work on arthropods, nematodes, and this one is, is my favorite. There's only one NLR that has been validated to function against parasitic plants, even though 1% of all plant species are actually parasitic. So look at the bias of our studies. I mean, really, the research we have, the research knowledge we have, the knowledge we have about this system is so biased towards a few model systems. And we really have no idea even about, obviously, all these parasitic plants that are infecting plants are also triggering immune responses and are being detected by plant immune receptors. But there's very little study on that. So again, we have to keep in mind that if you want to really um, make a dent in this world as a scientist, consider the fact that our research is, is biased. And I hope that this actually this database could serve as a guide towards uh, helping people identify the gaps in knowledge where we should really invest our research. Uh, so that's really the, the pitch I want to make with this ref plant and LR slides. Okay, a little bit of molecular uh, work here, and, 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 and this is important. You'll see later why it's important. Uh, how, what happens when these switches are activated? So when a pathogen comes and delivers a factor, this switch activates by forming oligomeric wheels that we call resistosomes. So uh, different classes make different types. These are the tier type NLRs. They have one, two, three, four, uh, proteins which form this wheel-like structure, uh, a tetramer, and then the CCNLRs, the famous one is ZAR1, make a pentamer. So there's five of these proteins, when they're activated, 
the oligomerize into this structure called the resistosome. And that structure is what causes the immune response. And this process is probably um, really related to the fact that these are really switches. The plant has to make sure it's not gonna die, right? So these are kept in an off uh, state unless a pathogen effector is there to activate it. A lot of mechanistic research is going on on this topic. And we now know that when uh, the CC type, the ZAR1 type, um, NLRs are activated into these resistosomes, there is a switch. So the alpha helix, the last bit, the first, sorry, the first uh, helix, the first uh, 17, 20 amino acids are um, uh, undergo this conformational change and they end up forming a channel that inserts into the membrane. And then this is basically thought to be calcium channel and probably other, other things might be uh, trafficking through this particular channel. But this, this activity, this resistosome inserts into the membrane, forms a pore, and that pore is really important for the, um, for the immune response to be activated through the cell death response. Actually, this is a bit of an old, now it's very uh, well known that, and well demonstrated that this is an iron, iron channel, in particular calcium channel. But uh, uh, keep in mind this alpha helix. So the end terminus here is really the business end of these proteins. And you see later why this is important. We really link this back to evolution later on. So uh, this is really fantastic work through um, cryo-EM technology, um, breakthrough that allows to understand how these proteins are activated, work mainly led by Gigi Shai in, in Beijing and, and, and Cologne. Okay, back to genetics. So um, uh, the field really started in the early 20th century uh, through the uh, definition of disease resistance genes by Roland Biffen. He was making crosses between wheat varieties, observed that single genes were actually defining the resistance phenotype to rust fungi. And so he came up with this concept that there are genes for resistance. About 50 years later, Harold Floor in the US, he brought the pathogen into this. And he came up with the gene for gene model, a very influential model or hypothesis that led a lot of research. Uh, and his point is that you need to have an R gene and what he called an AVR gene on the pathogen side. When those two are together, then you get the immune response, the activation of the immune response. This was a really elegant genetic model, which actually went and was influential beyond plant pathogen interaction, really guided a lot of research, in particular, a lot of plant breeding. The problem with Flohr's model is that, uh, as is the problem really with genetic approaches, when you're studying, when you're doing genetics, you're relying on natural diversity guiding you into what genes are actually polymorphic. When you say there's a gene for this, gene for that, that doesn't mean it's the only gene. That means it's a gene that is polymorphic in the population you're studying, uh, and therefore you can actually define it through classical genetics. And that was a bit the issue with floors. So now we know that these genes are super, super polymorphic in plant species. So of course, you're going to find the receptors as the R genes. And then on the other side, the effectors also are very polymorphic. They're constantly co-evolving with the plant, with the plant receptors. So they're also going to be uh, super polymorphic. So these are obviously the genes you're going to define. But that doesn't mean it's the only genes involved in that particular process. So beyond uh, floors model, um, now we think more also, of course, mechanistically and biochemically. So <clears throat> originally with Floor, the idea was like this gene for gene model is reflects biochemically, the biochemical sort of reflection or interpretation of this model is uh, an antigen receptor system, which activates a pathway, which results in some kind of immune response. So this was kind of the view and it turned out that this is much less frequent than uh, much more complex systems where we have a lot more complexity. We have actually immune networks and even more, we have immune receptor networks. So the receptors themselves, they are divided into um, receptors and co-receptors. We call these sensors in our jargon, doesn't matter much because they are the ones that are sensing the pathogens, again, either directly or indirectly. And then uh, these receptors are actually associated also with co-receptors which we call helpers or executors, which actually are the ones that execute the immune response, the cell death response. So there's a lot of complexity that evolved into the system that actually mirrors mammalian, for example, uh, immune receptors, animal metazoan, animal immune receptors, which also evolved in complex 
receptor network. So we have receptor networks, and this is a really important concept uh, beyond floors sort of gene for gene, which is a genetic model and it's valid, but it's a genetic model. We now know that we have receptor networks underpinning uh, plant immunity. And that's a very important concept also to tell you next. So this is the punchline. So uh, I told you there are receptor networks, and I want to start with the end, with the model, because it's easier also for a talk of this type. So what we think is happening now is that uh, NLRs, these uh, immune receptors of plants, intracellular immune receptors, well, they have to be multifunctional because they do two things. They detect the pathogen effector. This is the effector is being detected by this NLR. In this case, it's indirect, doesn't matter. But they also have to execute the uh, immune response, right? So our ancestral effector, the ancestral state, was a multifunctional effector, does the two jobs. It detects the effector and executes the cell death. But throughout evolution, what we can see very clearly now is we had specialization. We had some functionalization actually into specialized receptors that are either dedicated to sensing the pathogen and able to execute the immune response on their own, or are dedicated to executing the cell death response, the helpers, which are incapable of sensing the pathogens on their own. So these systems of sensor helpers, which occur in plant genomes, in plant cells, in multiple configurations of varying uh, complexity, is what the uh, NLR receptors evolved into. It's a fascinating system because the sensors, for example, sometimes integrated new domains. They became truly non-functional um, in terms of executing the cell death. They integrated new domains for detecting the pathogen effectors and unable to execute the immune response on their own. A bit like those penguins. Remember the penguins? They started as wings, and then they evolved into flippers or uh, whatever. So you have a lot of here a specialization and actually loss of function, sub-functionalization, because your multifunctional effector became now functionally specialized into these different categories, different functional categories. It's not as simple as that, because there are some NLR receptors that retained um, and, and retained sort of the capacity to work on their own without other NLRs. And, and those NLRs are uh, really interesting because they are not the ones that the, the Weigel type analysis will identify as very polymorphic. They're actually quite conserved. Uh, we studied one, that one, which is has basically orthologs uh, across over 100 species of plants. And we estimate this is over 150 million year old and basically behaves like a core gene in the plant genome. Uh, hasn't really changed much uh, over 150 million years. We call it Jurassic NLR, by the way. And uh, the reason that's the case is really fascinating because in this case, the sensing activity is not done by the receptor itself, it's done by the partner that is basically guarding the receptor. And the co-evolution between, between the um, that partner and the effectors is where the action is happening. So it's actually this kinase that is guarded by the receptor that's mimicking the target of the effector. That's the one that is doing the function of the sensor. So in this case, the sensor activity, the sensor function is done by a completely different biochemical player, kinase, that is now co-evolving and diversifying uh, with, with the plant effector. We discovered that this kinase occurs in a gene cluster that's also conserved across plant species, but is much more diverse than the NLR itself. So evolution, whatever, whatever works, right? So in this case, the sensor activity is taken over not by an NLR, but by a different biochemical entity, in this case, a kinase decoy or a kinase mimic. And this is the, the case of ZAR1. So I just added the slides, not very necessary, but ZAR1 emerged uh, about 150 million years ago. And, and basically, um, it stayed as, as, as an NLR without diversifying that much, but the kinase is diversified into these blue, green, and so on uh, type uh, entities. OK, another concept that's really fascinating is how these sensors uh, may, over time, about a subset of them, about 5% or so. And this is, by the way, um, uh, we have to recognize that it's a French discovery. Uh, the first paper that really articulated this was uh, 
led by Stella Cesari, who is now in Montpellier. And uh, it's a brilliant concept, really uh, a wonderful concept that really marries evolutionary biology with, uh, with uh, mechanistic science. So what Stella uh, discovered, and, and many others followed up on that, is that a subset of these NLR uh, receptors, about 5% of them, they acquired new domains uh, throughout evolution. So they went from this classical three domain architecture uh, into a, a multi domain architecture with a new domain. And it turned out that this domain uh, originates from the target of the effectors. So about 5% of the immune receptors integrated new domains that are not only targeted by, by the effectors, the, the virulence target of the effect. So they turn the table on the effectors and now they turn the table on the pathogen. So the target of the effector now is a bait, if you like, a bait or a decoy that is baiting the uh, effector um, by detecting it and binding it. A really fascinating concept. And we had the project when, um, by Ola Bialas uh, who studied the evolution of this system the integration uh, was estimated to be quite old, over 12 million years or so. Uh, this was a rice receptor, so this was before actually the emergence of the Oriza genus. And, and, and once when that effector uh, was integrated, we, uh, we don't know what it was detecting at the time, but it evolved into um, different types of alleles and, and orthologs which had different activities and evolved independently, convergently evolved to detect pathogen effectors from the blast fungus. Um, so uh, it's, it's an interesting system because it allows us to reconstruct the evolution of the integrated domain uh, quite, quite carefully. I would add that there was another uh, study by uh, Juan Carlos de la Concepcion. If you're interested in this topic, I encourage you to look at the paper. And he showed that when these pairs, because this was also a pair where we have a sensor and a helper, when these pairs diversified throughout evolution, they became mismatched. They uh, don't work together uh, uh, optimally because there is also coevolution between the two NLRs. And in particular, there was a single polymorphism here, which makes them either hypoactive or hyperactive. And so if you put them, if you mismatch them, then you get autoimmunity, you get the wrong, you get activation of the system without the presence of the pathogen, which obviously wouldn't work. And that's, this is just, um, I just want to highlight again, um, how the evolutionary perspective here can really um, let you to understand mechanistically the systems better, uh, because um, evolution does that to, to, to genes, basically, it pushes them towards being isolated and specialized and therefore uh, if you mismatch them you can have with this system you can have the wrong things happen okay i just want to have a shout out to this um uh, to this uh system and these two papers but um uh let me go back now to the networks uh, and uh, in our systems we study the solanaceae plants so potato tomato tobacco pepper uh, and in these plants we have a very complex network that has evolved we call this the NRC network because the helpers are these uh, three nodes. Um, we know there are more now, but let's keep it simple for now. It's uh, three nodes um, that are in this network, and these are the helper NLRs. They are absolutely essential for the sensor NLRs to function. So, for example, if you take this gene, it's RPI B2, it comes from a wild potato, it detects uh, the potato blight, Phytophthora infestans through this effector AVR B2, uh, that particular gene requires NRC4 to function. But if you take Rx, which is a virus resistance gene also from potato, that one functions with an RC2, with an RC3, and with an RC4. So we have a complex network with different, different configurations of complexity here in terms of how these sensors interact with the helpers. And this network, uh, in some species, about 50% of all the NLRs they have. So it's a really highly um, diversified and expanded network. Through phylogenetics, again, uh, the comparative approach here was very important for us to understand what's going on. We can see that this network evolved from uh, an ancestral pair, which was probably duplicated from a singleton. So again, like that model I showed you earlier, we have a multifunctional ancestor which diversified into pair and then to a network because all the sensors are in this clade 
highly expanded, as you expand the, expect the cells to be, because they are co-evolving with many pathogens. But all the helpers are in that sister clade. Uh, so all the NRCs are in this clade. And so far, we have 100% validation of this. Whenever we pick a gene from here, we can make autoactive mutants, autoimmune mutants. They always require an NRC to function. None of these are able to signal on their own without an NRC. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a system that evolved, we estimate, about 100 million years ago, early in the evolution of the asteroid family of, of plants. So we find this uh, not just in Solanaceae, uh, but also in other species uh, like lettuce, olive trees, ash trees, etc. Many, many other species have this uh, network. But this, this is only expanded in the asteroids and not in, in rosids, for example, or monocots. Okay, so um, the reason this is important to appreciate the fact that this, um, to have this phylogenetic sort of perspective and to appreciate that these have evolved from a singleton which duplicated in two pair that then later on specialized into uh, sensors and helpers is because we can now study at the molecular level what happened during this evolutionary transition from a multifunctional gene into specialized NLRs in specialized sensors and helpers. And uh, that's the sort of the, the, the question I will uh, lead you to. And, and of course, the other question is, why do we have a network here? Why do we have a receptor network? Why do these things evolve? And in biology, uh, there are two main reasons why we have network. One is robustness, and the second one is evolvability. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples to illustrate why we think that both of these reasons are probably um, why receptors have evolved into network, not just in plants actually, but also in animal systems. The immune system often leads to, um, to uh, these network configurations. So redundancy, uh, one reason, we have redundancy of core elements. I showed you this multiple NRCs. One reason would be evading, evading pathogen suppression, for example. What if the pathogens start targeting these core nodes. And we made that hypothesis early in this project. We said, if we have nodes in this network, uh, they are basically the Achilles heel of the immune system. So the pathogen is likely to have evolved effectors that suppress these nodes. If you suppress well, these nodes, you are taking out of action a big chunk of the immune receptors of the plants. So Lida Derevnina joined the lab at that time and we decided to make a screen. And I, I, it's, to cut a long story short, what Lida discovered is that there are effectors, there are actually two effectors she identified and studied in more details. One is from plant parasitic nematode, this potato cyst nematode. The other one is from the potato blight pathogen. Uh, and both of these directly target the NRCs themselves. So they are actually suppressing the nodes in the network. Uh, this particular nematode effect is really fascinating because this effector inhibits the NLRs, inhibits NRC2, for example, and blocks its oligomerization. So this is an experiment where we're doing blue native gels. Uh, so this is a biochemical readout for the oligomerization of the NLR. This is an inactive NLR. It's running here as uh, a dimer, most likely. But when it's activated, it forms this resistosome structure. But if we have the uh, effector from the nematode, it locks it into this complex. You can see this is also larger, larger than uh, the um, NLR on its own, and it gets locked into this inactive complex. The Phytophthora effector does differently. It degrades somehow. We don't know yet how, but it's degrading or making the oligomer, the resistosome, unstable in some way. So evolution, whatever works. So what happened here? We have core in this. Uh, we have a core node in the network and pathogens evolved to suppress this node at different levels. So we have this PRISEC15, which is directly inhibiting the resistosome, and this uh, other effector from a different pathogen convergently evolved to shut down the network at a different step, not by directly binding it, doesn't bind to it, but by acting at, at the lower level and probably making this resistosome unstable. And that's really beautiful. And, and there's really many, many examples here. If you have an important component in the immune system, you can bet that you're going to find pathogens that evolve to inhibit them. That arms race is going on 
independently of the detection arms race that Floor was really interested in. There's also an arms race going on between pathogen suppressors and, and plant immune components. Okay, the second point is evolvability. So um, a network uh, would also enable evolvability. And uh, that makes a lot of sense intuitively. And there's a lot of work written about that. Some evolutionary biologists don't like the concept, but I think it's a very powerful concept. When you have a complex system, you have much more potential for uh, generating functioning output. So let me give you an example to illustrate this point. If you uncouple recognition from signaling, then the, these proteins would be free to evolve much more in much more complex ways than if they're constrained by doing the two function one single molecule. So for example, you go to a restaurant, I was once in a restaurant in Tuscany and there was one guy who was doing everything. He was cooking, he was serving, he was uh, taking the orders. It was a small, tiny little place. There was maybe four tables and that poor guy, very dynamic Italian guy was, was actually doing everything in that restaurant. That restaurant would be very constrained. You cannot have 20 people in that restaurant because he was taking the orders, doing the cooking, doing everything. Uh, but if you have specialized actors, if you have a cook and a waiter and, and someone um, to, um, to bring the food to the table, etc., that, that complex system has much more potential to grow and, and, and develop. It's much more flexible its evolutionary potential is wider than if it was a single actor. And I think it's exactly the same thing that's going on here. So again, to illustrate my point, I showed you this model earlier. Think about these integrated domains. These guys, by being free to evolve in any way they can without being constrained by executing the cell death, start, for example, doing crazy things like integrating new domains that are acting at decoys to bait the pathogens. We now have molecular evidence for this. I told you earlier about ZAR1, how there's this alpha helix which flips out when this uh, NLR is activated. And that alpha helix goes on to make this funnel-like structure, which is the business end of, of these immune receptors. Well, that alpha helix is also conserved in our NRC helpers. So this is NRC4, uh, but other NRCs have the same, aligned to ZAR1. And you can see that the N-terminus of these proteins is very, very similar. Half of the residues are exactly the same. We call this the MADA motif, which is present in about 20% of the CCNLRs. Uh, you can see here there are many CCNLRs. In fact, PIC2 is one of these paired NLRs that is in rice, so a very distant plant from Arabidopsis, from the Solomonasis monocot. And PIC2 is the helper for the uh, PIC1 NLR, which has that integrated domain I showed you earlier. So um, the executors have a signature. Uh, this MADA sequence, which is the business end of causing the immune response, forming that channel and causing the immune uh, cell death response. What is totally fascinating is that if we look at our NRC network, only the NRCs have that sequence. So the, the branches in red are the NLRs that have the MADA motif, the business end of executing the cell death. Zero, absolutely zero, none of the sensors have that sequence. They all lost it throughout evolution. Evolution, use it or lose it. They don't need it. They are relying on the NRCs to cause the cell death. So throughout time, that sequence diversified and degenerated. In fact, even better, look at this. The, this particular clade of sensors, they integrated the domain, one of these decoy domains, before the alpha helix, before the CC domain, before the business end. So these there is no way these guys can function through that resistance on model because they have four or 500 amino acids even integrated before the business end of, of the resistance on. So that's what happened. We have degeneration here. We have basically sensors that have degenerated matter motif. They even have integrations before the, that business end of the protein. So they truly cannot function as executors their evolutionary potential was much wider than if they were constrained to execute the cell death. And by partnering with these helpers, which retained the more canonical uh, features of NLRs, the ancestral features of having the conserved sequence at the end terminus, the conserved uh, position, they can function as a complex system 
a complex network which has much more potential of keeping up with plant pathogens, even through integrating new domains. So that's my story, but remember the penguins, right? So if you're studying a single receptor, and trust me, that network we study, a lot of these sensor NLRs were very famous R genes that were cloned 20, 25 years ago. And people have been studying them for ages, trying to understand how they cause cell death. But they don't cause cell death. They are not causing cell death themselves. They are relying on their partners to cause cell death. So it's a little bit, when you're studying a single NLR, it's a little bit like you're studying a penguin. You may, you're missing the big picture. And it really um, required genomics to come to age and comparative genomics to really allow us to have this perspective because now we have access to all these genomes and we can have this perspective and we can look at NLR structure and function from an evolutionary angle and realize they have degenerated and they have evolved into all kinds of directions. Uh, and we need to go beyond that uniform view that one NLR equal one, one activity or one function. So I, 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 I think I can finish there. Ooh, um, took a bit more time, but uh, okay, this is for the students. Um, this is recorded, I'm happy to share this later, but don't neglect, neglect these topics. I, I really uh, don't have time to go through this. Maybe it will come up in the discussions, uh, but these to me are the, the key topics that every biology students need to appreciate. Uh, and, and I also want to point out the blog that um, Pierre Marc mentioned earlier, and, and there are some uh, interesting, I think, ideas that um, some of the ideas I mentioned will be discussed there. And I want to thank, of course, the folks who did the work. Many of them, um, I, I, I'm going to skip this because I want to have a discussion with you guys. Sorry uh, for the team, but some of these guys went on to have uh, great positions elsewhere. And these are my colleagues and collaborators. So with that, I'll um, hope there is at least 50 minutes for the discussion. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sofian. That was, uh, well, as expected, great. Uh, so thanks a lot for the, for the talk. Uh,